Not just because they trace and comment on the exemplary transitions from the earnest 1850s through the gay 1890s into the roaring 1920s, though they do remain fascinating guides to this history of change. Nor are they important just because they offer such a surprising gallery of possibilities within a society that also prided itself on the regulation of social and sexual propriety, though the picture of accommodation and exploration of relationships in and through the most privileged of social institutions is a telling counterweight to the current fascination with the more obviously and self-consciously outlandish groups of Bloomsbury or the aesthetes around Oscar Wilde. You don't need to go there for oddity. Indeed, one of the most remarkable features of the story I've been tracing is that it brings together men struggling with their desire for men, women experiencing desire for women, a marriage of conflicting desires, the interaction of widely different ages in erotic bonds, different generations responding to each other, and all talking and writing to each other about it at the same time. It's a true family romance, as Freud would have it, which offers a very different and more intricate matrix from the usual more restricted focus that historians offer. Rather, for me, what's most telling about the Bensons is the way in which convention and queerness are in constant and dynamic interaction, which allows us to see a sexual discourse under constant and often laborious construction. It's the struggle that they share and repeatedly mull over and write about between religious values and sexual needs, between social roles and playful difference, between public life and intimate intensity, between desire, physical acts, and a man's constitution, between living at the very center of the establishment and feeling a decentering untimeliness and alienation from the present. What makes this family truly very queer indeed is not just their unconventional sexuality, but more precisely how that sexuality is accommodated, denied, and negotiated within the tram lines and travails of a very conventional family indeed. The Bensons are an exemplary case of why the language of homosexuality took so long to condense and solidify in British sexual discourse, and why it's so unsatisfactory a language of description for the generations in which it was being developed. The oddity of the Bensons, the way in which they do not conform to conventional models of sexuality, provides a refractive historical mirror for our own contemporary drive towards labelling the pathologies of desire. True queerness is what is hard to name. And if you want to write the history of sexuality in this period, it's the struggle over language, behaviour and self-understanding in which we find the real work of sex taking place. Thank you. <laughs>